Hello everyone. Welcome back from spring break. I know it was not a fun spring break like previous years. We're all going through these crazy times now. So hope you all are safe, you know, and stay home and practice social distance because these are indeed some very bad times. Um, and unfortunately, we're all stuck at home. So just stay home and um, I, I hope all of you guys stay well. So having said that, we still have to continue with our class. And as you know, we will be transitioning this class to an online class from this week. So basically, the whatever the remaining lectures are, we will be doing that through online. Okay, and the tests will be also online. Now, if you remember, um, we had two more exams left. And one of the exam was scheduled on March 31st. So because of the extended spring break, I am pushing back midterm two by one week and it will be held on April 6th or and April 7th. Uh, so it, there will be a time period and you will be given with more instructions um, on when the exam will be available. And it will be an online exam where you have to, where it will be all multiple choice questions right now um, because it's online and you just take the exam it's 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 the class time it's one hour um, 20 minutes and you take that exam um, but and then but but it's other than that we will cover the other materials and then finish the class on time so having said that today we are going to start talking about chapter 8 chapter take 8 talks about Keynesian analysis and it is very interesting because this is the time Keynesian talks about how we can take out the economy from recession and it is very important in in today's time because you know right now the economy is in a recession because of the coronavirus pandemic the economy has got into a recession and maybe if we understand the Keynesian theory it may help us to ex understand or provide solutions how we can take the economy out of the recession okay now if you remember um, like previously we talked about classical theory and new classical theory and classical theory the basic principles of classical theory was that whenever you know <laughs> everything we start with the supply and supply will create its own demand right and classical theory also says that in the long run the economy will always come back to equilibrium um, you know uh, in the short run we can have some recessions we can have some disruptions in the economy but in the long run because of flexible interest rate and flexible prices and wages the economy will always come back to equilibrium however when the Great Depression hit in the 1940s, the classical theory failed and the economy was not adjusting back to equilibrium or stability in the long run. People were losing job, demand was going down, business in inventories um, in the market were going up. And, you know, although we learned in last class or in, uh, in our previous lectures that even though um, interest rates were reduced, but businesses were still not motivated to take um, loans in order to make investments. On the other hand, um, although prices and wages did go down, but the fall in consumption was so much that the fall in, um, you know, the fall in price and wage was not enough to cover up that gap. So that's when people started looking into other theories. Uh, so people basically wanted to um, see what, what type of solutions we have in order to solve this Great Depression. Many theories came into, flo uh, came into you know, started floating around in the economy. But the most important theory that uh, um, was introduced during that period was by economist Maynard Keynes. And, you know, if you can see the theory is, um, is related to his name, right? It's Keynesian theory. So basically it's Keynes theory. And he came up with this model to explain how we can take the economy out of recession. So according to this theory, what it says is when the economy is depressed and when the economy is going through a recession, like everyone is losing jobs, there's no investment, consumption is falling. At that time, the economy will not adjust automatically and it will not come back to equilibrium automatically. It, it's in, in complete contrast to a classical theory because classical theory says 
Well, in the short run, we can have some recession, but interest rate and prices and wages will vary and it will bring the uh, economy back to equilibrium. But this Keynesian theory is saying that if we have a recession or depression, economy will not automatically adjust to full equilibrium. A third agent has to act in order to bring the economy back to equilibrium. And basically, they are saying in this type of situation, the government is the one who should intervene in the market in order to bring the economy back to equilibrium. Again, this is the biggest difference between classical theory and Keynesians. Keynesians, classical, if you remember, said there is no government at all. Whereas Keynesians are saying in cases of depression and when the economy is going through bad times, that's when government must intervene into the market to bring the economy back to equilibrium. This theory compared to the other theories that were floating around at the time of the Great Depression was less extreme. You know, there were other theories like communist theories, there were socialist theories, and then we had also even had Hitler's fascist theory. But this one was more um, or this one was less extreme than the other theories and it definitely provided a, a, more, um, so, a more you know reliable solution to take the economy out of the recession or Great Depression. This theory in the 1930s, this is the group of people um, who worked with Keynes and Keynes as well, predicted that the economy will get into a recession in the 1940s and it will not be able to adjust automatically to bring it back to equilibrium. And it says that, you know, someone, some other agent, the government has to intervene in order to bring it back to equilibrium. Now, another big main difference between Keynesian theory and classical theory is that, if you remember, classical theory says supply will is most important. We always focus on the aggregate supply. If you remember, we focus on the long run aggregate supply curve and the supply curve, and supply will create its demand. But in in case of Keynesian theory, it's just the opposite. The focus is on the demand. The Keynesian group says demand will create their own supply. So that was another big difference. The first, the first difference was classical theory says no government at all. Keynesian says, you know, when economy is going through recession, we need to have the government intervene into the market to bring it back to equilibrium. The second difference is Keynesian, uh, classical people are saying supply creates its demand, whereas the Keynesians are saying demand creates its supply, so we should focus on the aggregate demand. Moving on to the next slide. So basically, the Keynesians are saying aggregate demand is the most important element in the business cycle. In order to bring an economy out of recession, we should focus on aggregate demand. So, you know, changes in aggregate demand was causing, you know, because the aggregate demand was falling so much, that's why the economy was not getting out of recession. And it is the is seen as the energy to pull the economy out of recession. Now, another thing, another difference between the two, and if you remember, classical theory said in the long run, savings will always be equal to investments. Because, you know, when savings is equal to investment, that's because of flexible interest rate, that's when the economy will come back to equilibrium. However, the Keynesian says, well, savings, consumption, and investments, these are all very important in the business cycles, but... Under Keynesians, savings is rarely equal to investments. So they, 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 this group of people or this group of economists are saying savings, even in the long run, savings is not equal to investments. And they are saying there are three reasons why savings is not equal to investments. This slide is important. You know, this, uh, the, uh, the why savings is not equal to investment under Keynesian theory. This might be a question in your multiple choice. Um, uh, in your midterm too. So make sure you understand the three reasons. Okay. So first of all, savings, when we, when we keep savings, we often keep savings, um, you know, in order for a future transaction, in order for a future household transaction, maybe, you know, some, we, let's say we get income of $3,000 and we keep $500 aside every month as savings, you know, just in the hope that in, after three years, I'll probably buy a car or maybe I get $10,000 savings every 
um, a month and then I save three thousand um, dollars and then after two years I want to plan I want to buy a home so basically savings is sometimes accumulated by consumers for household purchases you know for purchases other than your households you know such as buying a car or buying a home you know uh, that would be that's one reason why I keep savings the second one is savings is also accumulated for speculations you know sometimes we keep some savings on our bank accounts so whenever there's some unique business opportunities that come in um, then I can invest in that maybe in the future you know the stock markets uh, is something that attracts me and I want to use some of my savings money to invest in the stock market to make more money or maybe you know a restaurant opportunity comes up and I want to use some of my savings money to make investments for a restaurant you know so, so that's that's another reason why savings is not equal to investment and the third reason why savings is not equal to investment is because sometimes we keep uh, some actually most of the times we keep savings is for precautionary reasons you know like even you can relate it today you know right now we are going through a recession economy is all restaurants hotels airports are shut down and basically most businesses are stopped and you know some people are losing their jobs so savings right now is helping them because they kept savings for precautionary reasons so savings is sometimes set aside for precautionary reasons just in case if there is any financial distress so these are the three reasons why savings is not equal to investments okay so the motives for uh, for savings are short term and the motives for investments is basically to make more profit right so the two different motives uh, the, so savings has a different motive investment has a different motive and that's why savings is not equal to investment in the long run that's what the Keynesians are saying they have two different motives and that's why they are not equal to one another on the other hand savings if you think savings and investments are not equal because they gave three reasons because we set aside for unique opportunities for precautionary reasons and then we set aside for speculations as well as for deferred transactions okay so now when we move to the next slide Keynesians also says that prices and wages are not very flexible you know um, yeah we can to some extent the price and wage can fall but the fall in the aggregate demand during a recession will be so much that this wouldn't will not be enough to bring the economy back to equilibrium so what will happen is even though price and wage went down but aggregate demand will fall down by a greater extent so that means business inventory is still increasing in the market so also another reason why prices and wages are often called sticky and they, they they are not very flexible the Keynesians say that because there are monopoly or oligopoly type of businesses in the market you know like if, if I'm the only supplier in the market let's say I am the only um, uh, le I only produce leather jackets in the market and nobody else is there then I, I there's no need for me to uh, lower my price you know I will probably not lower my price you know and sometimes labor labor will not be ready to accept <laughs> lower wages and then it's not also easy to replace those labor all the time you know sometimes who's skilled in making a jacket cannot be easily replaced I, I just cannot hire someone who does not have experience or to um, uh, sew a leather jacket right so, so th for these reasons price and wages are not flexible and as a result that's why the economy is not coming back to equilibrium and uh, so Keynesians proved that even though interest rates are flexible savings are not equal to investments because of those three reasons that we keep savings for precautionary reasons we keep savings for deferred transactions and we keep savings for speculations on the other hand Keynesians also say that you know economy does not come back to equilibrium because prices and wages are not actually flexible they are sticky they do not want to adjust with changes in the demand so that's another reason why we ha still have recession going on and economy does not automatically adjust 
So under the Keynesians, I mean, I, I'm moving to the next slide. Under the Keynesian theory, investment can be categorized into two types, planned investment and unplanned investments. Okay, so basically, you know, total investment is given by planned investment plus unplanned investments in the economy. Okay, so planned investment means, you know, like let's say I, I produce water bottles and um, there's a, sh you know, in Walmart, every month I supply 10 bottles of water or 10 pack of 10 packs of water bottles. Okay. So the investment that I have to make every month in order to produce that 10 pack of water bottles or 10 water bottles is plan investment because I know what I have to spend in order to provide that supply of water bottles. So it basically plan investment means what businesses wish to invest in order to maintain their current inventory levels in the market. So in order to maintain their current inventory level, what, what, how, how much money they have to spend, that's plan investment. Now, if we go a little bit into deeper, if the planned investments in the economy is greater than your savings, then we are going to have economic growth. If planned investments is less than savings, then we are going to have recession. Okay, so this is important. Again, I'm trying to show this if in the slide, if planned investment is greater than savings, we will achieve economic growth. That means uh, you know, <laughs> businesses are making investments, they're creating more employment, people have more money in their hand, they're using the money to buy goods and services. So that's why we have growth. But if planned investment is less than savings, that means, you know, there's not much investments in the economy, people are not uh, spending money, they're saving the money. As a result, we will have recession. Now also remember that income you know, when we get income, we can use it in two ways, right? Either consumption or savings. So when savings increase, consumption will fall also, right? So let's say um, we start saving more money. That, what, that, what does that mean in terms of consumption? Our consumption is going down. So when consumption is going down, what happens to the business inventories in the market? People are not going to the market to buy those inventories. As a result the level of inventory is going up. So when level of inventory is going up, what will businesses do? They will reduce their uh, investments because they don't need to replace those um, uh, water bottles anymore. People are not buying that. So basically, planned investment goes down. So that's why we will get into a recession because it will ultimately decrease your output and employment. Now, under Keynesian, there is another type of investment called the unplanned investment. So, unplanned investment is when, basically, you, uh, the businesses ha will have to make, or businesses will have to make investments when there is an unexpected increase or decrease in sales. Basically, unplanned means unexpected investments. You know, sometimes you have to spend more. You see there's an increase in demand in the market for your water bottles. So unexpectedly, you have to spend more money in order to increase the supply. So instead of 10, I will now have to produce 15 water bottles. So let's let's take the example of, uh, you know, wipes right now, you know, or let's say hand sanitizers. You know, people People are people are not getting hand sanitizers into the market right now because they're scared they're buying the hand sanitizers. So as a, if I'm a supplier of hand sanitizer, what will I do? I will basically see there's more demand. So I will, I, there's suddenly an increase in demand for my product. So there is an unexpected investment I will have to make in order to increase the supply into the market. And that is exactly what is called unplanned investments. So if you look at the formula, if you look at this side, Total investment in the economy is given by unplanned investment plus planned investments. So let me take out this board and show you guys. So total investment. Well, it looks like it's, it's not that clear. Let me use the. Let me use this pen. So. So total investment equals unplanned investment plus 
plus planned investment. Okay. And then another thing we have to know is unplanned investment is actually given by this formula. Unplanned investment is actually given by savings minus planned investment. So note down this note down these um, formulas and right now we will do an example so that you guys understand how we can apply these in real life or in the economy and how we can get these numbers all right so let's look at um, example of planned investments unplanned investments and savings okay so let's say you're given with this um, um, table So on the first one, you have disposable income, okay, then you have consumption, okay, then you have savings, then you have planned investments, then you have aggregate demand, and then you have unplanned investments, okay. So let's say these are the items in your table. Sorry, my handwriting is not that good, but I hope that's big enough for you to understand. Okay, so let's say we are given with these income, 2,000, then 2,200, then 2,400, and then 2,600. Okay, and let's say you're also given with the consumption information. Now, let's say you are actually spending $2,040. Here, you're spending $2,200. Then, you are spending $23. 60 and then here you're spending 25 20 okay and let's say we know what plan investments will be because we know how much we will have to invest every month in order to supply the water bottles or, or how much investments we need to make in order to maintain the current inventory level so let's say this is given by 40 and this will remain the same in all these cases just in this example let's say this remains the same everyone you have to spend the same amount of money in order to produce 10 bottles of water or let's say 10 packs of bottles of water just as an example okay so given this information i can ask you to complete the remaining portion of the table so let's start off by trying to complete savings okay so we know when we get income, we can either spend it or we can save it, right? So if my income is $2,000 and I am actually spending more than my income, $2,040, let's say using credit card or maybe I took a loan from someone. So what is my saving in this case? In this case, my savings is actually $2,000 minus $2,040 because I am spending more than my income. So my savings is actually minus $40. Okay, now let's go to the next one. Let's say my income is 2200 and I'm spending all of my money. So that means my savings is zero. That's easy. Now let's say my income is 2400 but I'm only spending 2360 So how much am I saving now? Now I'm starting to save some money. So in this case, I will be saving 2400 minus 2360 which is 40 dollars because i am spending this 2360 dollars and the remaining 40 dollars is what i'm trying to save and if we look at the next one my income is 2600 and my consumption is 2520 okay so how much am i saving i am saving 2600 minus 2520 which is 80 dollars Okay, so it's simple, you know, savings is basically we are just doing disposable income minus your consumption that will give us 
your savings. So this column is done. Now let's move on to the next column, aggregate demand. Aggregate demand in this case will be a summation of your consumption plus your plan investment. So this plus this. Okay, this is equals to C plus PI. Okay, so in this case, aggregate demand is your consumption is 2040 and your plan investment is 40. So if we add these two numbers, the aggregate demand will be 2080. Okay, same way if your consumption is 2200 and your plan investment is $40, we add those two numbers and we get 2240. Third level, we see the consumption is 2360 and we add $40, so that's 2400. And lastly, if we see your consumption is 2520 mm -hmm. and then your plan investment is 40, so your, your uh, aggregate demand is basically 2560. Okay, now that leaves us with the last column, which is unplanned investments. In case there is a sudden increase in demand or sudden decrease in demand, what is the investment that we have to make, okay, in this scenario? Now, remember the formula for unplanned investment. This is given by savings minus planned investments, okay? So here... Savings is minus 40, and what is planned investment? 40. So minus 40 minus 40 is actually minus $80. Okay. Then if you look at the next one, again, savings is $0 in that level, and planned investment is 40. So 0 minus 40 is actually minus 40. And then third level, 40 is your savings, but planned investment is also equal to 40. So 40 minus 40 is equals to 0. And in this case, the last level, we have savings of $80 and we have planned investments of $40. So unplanned investment is equal to 80 minus 40 and we have plus or positive 40. Okay. One thing to remember Given this scenario, if I ask you what is the point where the economy e will be at equilibrium, then we will say this is the point where economy is in equilibrium. So basically when your unplanned investment is zero, that's when your economy is at equilibrium. So if I ask you what is the disposable income at equilibrium, then you would see the disposable income is 2400 and it is the equilibrium. How do I know that? Because the unplanned investment is equal to zero. So that means the economy is in equilibrium in, in, at this point. So maybe in your homework, you might have, a, in your next homework, you might have an example or a table like this. I'm going to ask you to complete it and then I will ask you why, what, what point is the economy at equilibrium. So again, you know the economy is at equilibrium when unplanned investment is equal to zero and the corresponding income is your GDP or disposable income at equilibrium. All right, folks. So when we look at the Keynesian business cycle, the Keynesians say that the aggregate demand is actually composed of consumption, investments, government, and foreign sector. So that's another big difference uh, between uh, classical and Keynesians. So if we look at it, so classical, if you see classical, you remember the aggregate demand was com composed of only C and I, okay? But in Keynesian, they say that the aggregate demand is actually composed of C plus I plus government plus the foreign sector, okay? So that's aggregate demand. So that's another big difference between the two. Okay, so if we, the, when we talk about the aggregate demand curve, that is actually composed of consumption, investment, government, and foreign sector. Now, let's go back and look into the Keynesian analysis, um, you know, the, uh, the graph, 
that we looked at it when we were looking at demand pool inflation. So if you remember, this was a graph when we have three stages when the supply curve looked different, right? And then this is, if you remember, stage one, stage two, and this is stage three. Okay, and then these were the aggregate demand curve, AD2, AD3, and then we had AD4. Okay, so what Gainshans are saying is when the government increases spending, the AD will shift to the right. Okay, because government spending is a part of aggregate demand. So when you are increasing government spending, aggregate demand will go up and the aggregate demand curve will shift to the right. And this in turn will increase your consumption and your investment which will cause the aggregate demand curve to shift to the right further taking the economy out of recession. Okay. So let me give you an example. Let's say right now we have this coronavirus pandemic going on, right? People lost their jobs. People do not have enough income in their hands. Now government decides that they will spend money in the economy and then they will build hospitals or they will arrange hospital arrangements, make hospital arrangements for the patients uh, all over the country. So what will happen when government is investing that money to start hospitals? What will happen? They will hire nurses, they will hire doctors, they will hire other types of staffs in order to run the hospitals, right? So as a result of these investments, income, these nurse doctors and uh, these nurse doctors and staffs will get employed and they will get income in return, right? Now with that income, what are they going to do? With that income, they will start consuming. So consumption goes up, right? Because they, people have more income now. Now they will start spending that money to buy goods. So consumption goes up. Now when consumption is going up, we will, the aggregate demand curve shifts to the right, right? But then when consumption goes up, what happens? People are going to the market to buy goods and services. What's happening to the inventory? So the inventory of goods and services are going down because people are now buying goods. So in order to maintain the existing inventory, what will the businesses do? Businesses will start making investments. So that means your eye will also go up at the same time and aggregate demand curve will shift to the right again. So overall, your output, if you see in this case, the price is not going up, just the output will be going up. In this case, price and output both are going up. But when output is going up, more employment is created. People have more income in their hand. And as a result, the aggregate demand curve shifts to the right and economy is pulled out of the recession. All right. So another thing that the Keynesians uh, talk about is that, let's say when the economy is going through a recession, and government increases spending or the G goes up, then it will have a multiplied impact on aggregate demand. In other words, basically what we just discussed in uh, we discussed just a minute ago that when government expenditure goes up, this in turn will increase your consumption and which in turn will increase your investment. So there will be a magnified effect on aggregate demand and aggregate demand will go up by a greater percentage. So let's say if we say, you know, uh, if government spending goes up by 5%, then what this is saying is then aggregate demand will probably go up by a greater percentage. Let's say, just as an example, will go up by an 8%. Okay, so, or if government expenditure goes up by, let's say, 4%, then there is a magnified effect on aggregate demand and aggregate demand will, let's say, go up by 7%. So this concept is known as the multiplier effect. It's also in your slide and I will get to your slide shortly. But basically, this 
means multiplier effect. So if I, if I now I'm in your slide, if you see what it's saying is when the government expenditure increases, there we will have a larger impact on the aggregate demand, and this is impact is known as the multiplier impact or multiplier effect. It's very interesting, and I will give you a real world example to show how we have that you know and you have to know that you have to know how to calculate that because in your exam and in your homework you will have that problem okay but in order to understand the multiplier effect we need to understand a couple more items okay because when when the government injects money or um, they or injects income into the money uh, or injects income into the economy it becomes someone's income and then someone spends this money to buy goods which in turn becomes the income for another party right so this goes on and you know the ultimately there is a magnified impact on the national output level and this this multiplier effect will only stop when the net amount of increased savings or the net increase in savings is equal to your increase in initial spending okay so the multiplier effect will keep on going on where if let's say government injects two hundred thousand dollars and there will be a multiplied effect going on into the economy until the increase in the amount of savings is equal to your increase in initial spending okay but again in order to see how it actually works in an economy uh, we have to know certain other concepts okay and that's what we're going to look into it uh, right now so the first concept we have to understand is called the average propensity to consume what this means is given you have an income what is your tendency what is your average tendency to spend that income that's average propensity to consume okay so you know um, let's say you have five thousand dollars and you want to spend and you spend three thousand you need, on average you spend three thousand dollars then your you know what is your APC or what's your average propensity to consume and the formula is given by if you see in the slide is given by your consumption divided by your income similarly there is another concept called average propensity to save what it means is basically given you have uh, given you have a level of income what is your average tendency to save that income again let's say you have five thousand dollars and you spend two thousand dollars and you and you save two thousand dollars then that's your average tendency that you save two thousand dollars when you get five thousand dollars okay and it's also given by the formula APS is given by the formula savings divided is APS is given is equal to savings divided by your income one thing you have to remember is when we add this average propensity to consume the APC and we add the APS it will always be equal to 1 okay now let me do an example to show how you calculate average propensity to save and average propensity to consume let's say let me show you let's say your income is ten thousand dollar and you spend eight thousand dollar okay so what is your APS and APC now remember in, in in my previous classes I have seen students confused with average propensity to consume and average propensity to save so don't confuse one another APC is related to consumption APS is related to savings okay so let's first start with APC the average propensity to consume so what I am asking is you spend eight thousand dollars when your income is ten thousand dollars so what is your average tendency that you will spend the money and if you remember the formula is consumption divided by income which is equals to eight thousand divided by ten thousand and that is equals to zero point eight okay so that's your APC this number zero point eight is your APC okay and then I also ask what is the APS in this case okay 
So APS is given by, if you remember, go back to the slide and see, savings divided by your income. Now here, if you see, I did not give you any information on savings, but you can definitely deduct from the information that I gave you what your savings would be. If out of $10,000, you're spending $8,000, then what are you doing to the remaining $2,000? you're definitely saving the remaining $2,000. So in this case, your savings is actually $2,000. So that means your APS will be $2,000 divided by 10,000, which is your income, is equals to 0 0.2. So that's your APS. Now one way to check whether you did your work right is always remember APS plus APC is equals to 0. Point, um, is equal to, I'm sorry, this is always equals to 1. Okay, so again, if you see 0, if you add 0. 0.8 plus 0. 0.2, we do get equals to 1. So that's one way you can check your work if you did it right or wrong, okay? So that's what it is. Average propensity to consume is basically what is your average tendency that you will spend your income. And average propensity to save is what is your average tendency to save your income, okay? And why we are looking into this is because you will see these are important in order to see how we have a multiplied impact on the economy when there is an increase in government expenditure. Okay, so now we move on to the next concept, which is known as the marginal propensity to consume and marginal propensity to save. This is important, okay? And it is related to your marginal income, which means your increase in income. Whenever, remember, marginal means an additional, your additional income. Marginal income means your additional income. So that's what marginal income means, okay? So first, let's start with marginal propensity to consume. What it means is if there is an increase in income or in your income, how much of that income will you spend? That's MPC or marginal propensity to consume. The tendency to spend your additional income that you're getting, okay? So the tendency to spend the extra income you're getting, how much of that extra income are you going to be spending? Similarly, the marginal propensity to save is the tendency to spend your addition is the tendency to save your additional income. So if you're getting additional income, how much from that income are you going to save? And that's also known as MPS. And also, like previously, MPS plus MPC will always be equal to one. So let me do an example again. Okay. Let's say your income was $10,000 in 2019 and in 2020 your income went up to $20,000 okay so that's your income okay now you're also given that the out of your new income, you will spend $9,000. Out of your new income, so what is your extra income that you're earning between these two years? The extra income that you're earning is actually 20,000 minus 10,000, which is equals to 10,000, right? Now, out of this 10,000, you will be spending $9,000. That's what I have given you because out of the new income, out of the new income, you will be spending $9,000, okay? So, given this information, what is your MPC? So, MPC will be equal to what, what is the extra income you're spending when you have that extra income. So the extra income you're spending is 9,000 9, divided by the extra income. The extra income you're getting is 10,000, which is equals to 0 
9. So that's your MPC, marginal propensity to consume, because you're spending $9,000 of the $10,000. Now, if I ask you what is your MPS, easiest way to calculate is equals to 1 minus MPC. If you remember, MPC plus MPS is equal to 1. So we just took MPC on the other side. So what we know is 1 minus 0 0.9. And that is equals to 0 0.1. And this information is very important because this MPS ultimately determines how much effect we are going to have on the economy when there is an increase in government spending. If, we ha if the MPS is more, the impact is going to be less. If the MPS is less, the impact is going to be more because that means if MPS is more, that means the additional income that we are getting, we are saving most of the money and there will be less additional impact on the economy or on the other hand if the MPS is low that means we are spending more money in the economy and as a result the impact on aggregate demand will be much higher so hopefully this example gives you um, a good idea of what MPC MPS means what APC and APS means again make sure you do not confuse marginal propensity to savings and marginal propensity on consumer. I have seen many students confuse that. So make sure in the question when I ask you, make sure you look at it and see if it's MPS or MPC, if it's APS or APC. Okay. Um, these are the building blocks. So, um, you know, next we are going to look into how we can use this information to calculate the impact on the economy when government increases um, expenditure or their spending. Okay, so now we will see how we can calculate the multiplied impact when, um, when, when the economy is going through a recession and government decides to inject money or government decides to invest into the economy, how it will have a multiplied impact or how the total GDP will go up. So basically, there's three steps to calculate that. Okay, so step one, let me show you here. Step one is basically... Step one is to calculate MPS. So first step is to calculate the marginal propensity to consume. If you remember, just now we showed you what MPS means and how you can calculate marginal propensity to save. You know, so that's the first step. And then step two is to calculate the multiplier. So by how much? The multiplier will go up by so multiplier by how much the, 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 the multiplied effect will be so multiplier is multiplier calculation that's step two and it's given by the formula multiplier is given by one divided by MPS okay and then we have step three which is the final step which is actual increase in output or actual increase in GDP equals your initial injection the government is putting in, the initial money the government is spending times your multiplier. So these are the three steps. So if government decides to build hospitals across the nations, we will use these steps to calculate the ultimate impact, the ultimate impact on GDP or what will be the actual increase in GDP. Of course, the government expenditure increases. GDP will definitely go up by that uh, amount. But at the same time, it will also have a multiplied impact because it affects your consumption investments and other elements right also exports and imports are affected so what will be the ultimate impact on that on the GDP if we have an increase in or if we have a government expenditure increase so I'm gonna give a minute so you can look at the steps again step one is first to calculate the marginal propensity to consume step two is basically multiplier 
calculation you need to calculate the multiplier and that is given by 1 divided by MPS and then step 3 is what is your actual increase in GDP it's basically initial injection times your multiplier okay so right now I will do an example so you guys can understand how we can use these steps in real world life okay So let's say the government decides to inject or invest $100,000. Let's say just let's keep it simple. They will only invest $100,000 to build an assisted living in the economy. Okay. And then out of this 100000 80,000 will be consumed. Basically, when this money is going as income to the people, they will spend $80,000 um, and the remaining 20,000 they will save. Okay. Given this, what is the question? My question will be, given this information, what is your actual increase in GDP or output? okay that's the question given to you. you have this information and then I ask you using this information calculate what will be the actual increase in GDP okay so then we remember last I just did the three steps in order to do that okay so step one is to calculate MPS okay so MPS is equals to you remember 1 minus MPC okay now here we are saying we are given that out of the hundred thousand we will spend eighty thousand so that's MPC we are spending eighty thousand out of the hundred thousand so your MPC is 0 0.8 that means your MPS will be man minus 0 0.8 which is equals to 0 0.2 okay so that's how we calculated MPS another way we can easily calculate is if you see if you look at here your your 80,000 is your consumption but out of 100,000 if you are spending um, 80,000 then what are you saving? You're saving 20,000, right? So if you can calculate MPS by dividing 20,000 by 100,000, which will give us the same results of 0 0.2. Okay, now let's say we will now we move on to the next step, which is step two. Okay, so step two is to calculate the multiplier. Now, if you remember, multiplier is given by 1 divided by MPS so in this case it's 1 divided by 0 0.2 which gives us 5 so the multiplier is 5 now the last step is to calculate the actual increase actual increase in GDP okay now if you remember the formula is initial injection times multiplier okay so now we already know multiplier is equals to 5 but what is our initial injection again go back to the question government invest hundred thousand dollars that's your initial injection so we know what is the initial injection into the economy it's hundred thousand dollars so initial injection is hundred thousand dollars and we know the multiplier is 5 
So the actual increase in GDP is 500,000. So look at this. The government is injecting $100,000 into the economy, but as a result, we have a magnified impact and our output is actually going up with 500,000 because, you know, when again, when I explain, if G goes up, it will have an impact on C, it will have an impact on investments, it will have an impact on foreign sectors. So all those elements will go up, causing the aggregate demand curve to go up by 500,000. So that is a good thing. And that is what it will take the economy out of the recession. Um, so hope this example gives you a better idea of how we can calculate, um, you know, that, uh, you know, and in the next class, we will see basically when government is injecting this money, they have to get this money from somewhere, right? So that that also has a negative impact onto the economy. So that we are going to look in the next class. But one last thing I wanted to go over was basically there's two concepts for multiplier. And if you look at the slide that I'm um, that I open right now is positive multiplier and negative multiplier. So positive multiplier is when there is an initial increase in government sp spending, the GDP goes up by a greater amount. So let's say the, the government increases spending by 2% and GDP goes up by 4%. That's positive multiplier. On the other hand, negative multiplier means when the government decreases spending, you know, an, an example would be tax. If government is imposing taxes, then it will have a negative multiplier impact on GDP. So which means if there is an initial decrease in injection, then the GDP will go down by a greater percentage. Again, let's say government reduces expenditure by 2%, but the output will fall by 3% or by 4%. Then that's an example of negative multiplier. So that is all for lecture 14. Um, you know, in my next video, I will give you, um, I, I will talk about lecture 15. And again, if you remember, your exam will be up to lecture 15. So, you know, after lecture 15, we will have the midterm exam um, the next week. So if you have any questions or if you are facing any difficulties understanding or, you know, the problems I'm doing, if you're having difficulties understanding or how I'm doing it, you can email me and I will try to address those questions separately to all of you. Thank you.